Well, good afternoon. I forgot my, my hammer, so I can't thump it on the podium. That's part of the privilege of doing this, is being able to pound that, and I forgot it. <laughs> oh, yeah, I can borrow one of the, I can borrow the ice and tough over there. Uh, well, just a quick note. The other day I was, uh, I was in between projects at home and tired and everything else, so I sat down and watched some old Mission Impossible, the old, old stuff. You know, it's really good. Seems like every time they wanted to disguise themselves, they put on these black rimmed glasses. So that's my reading glasses, so it's really not me up here. I'm pretending to be somebody else. Uh, we got a few announcements. So, uh, Sorry. Um, I'm also, so I'm Lucy Jordan. I'm also the treasurer of the Salt Lake chapter of the Association for Women Geoscientists. And every year we do this fundraiser. It's this year, it's March 30th. So it's the last Saturday of this month. And it's our 30th anniversary year of doing this. And so it's a fundraiser for scholarships. We're giving away $6,300 in scholarships to deserving female, mostly female um, undergrad and graduate students wanted to go to field camp. But we also have a new one on the Lee Allison. This is, I think, our third year of the Lee Allison Professional Development. It was a memorial for Lee Allison, who some of you probably know, um, to provide funds for, um, like we gave one to go to a conference in Iceland last year, and Rebecca Hunt Foster, who's out at Dinosaur now, she went to a conference in Calgary. So there's opportunities for lots of women to get um, funds through this, but we need to raise the funds for it. So March 30th, it's a silent auction and in quotes, wine tasting, because we can't put that on any of our, on our, our stuff, but I can say it out loud <laughs> um, because it's Utah. It's at um, Westminster on the Draw, which is a dorm right across from Sugar House Park, like right off of I-80. I um, and it's, it's cheap to get in. It's only 25 bucks to get in. That gets you wine and dessert. We have it catered, um, some snacks. Um, and this year we're doing our 30th anniversary. So we're having a contest for the best plaid outfit because geologists wear plaid. Um, so there's a lot of people in here that have supported us over the years. Bill Lachlan is a big supporter. Steve Shamel, he's back there. Um, Dave Simon, I think all three of you guys have donated this year, so there's opportunities to donate money, um, come have a good time. It's, we call it the Geoscience Association, or Geoscience Social Event of the Year, because you see all your buddies. Margie has been influential in getting us donations. Um, if you have anything you'd like to donate, um, you could contact me. I'm here at UGS, Lucy Jordan, or um, email our chapter is awg.slchapter at gmail.com. Um, so that's why we, we run this thing is we get donations of rocks and minerals and rock jewelry and paintings and um, you know gift certificates and anything that is of value that people might want to bid on. So um, anyway, come on out to that. It's for a great cause and it's a lot of fun. And you can buy Bob Beek's homemade um, professional grade pottery. <laughs> All right, thanks. Leslie, you want to come up for your announcement? Hi there, I'm Leslie, and as the president-elect uh, for UGA, I am looking at the energy and mineral resources 30 years ago that Lee Allison put out, and for 2020, 30 years, we can do renewable energies, what's latest in the mining business, how we take things from cradle to grave. Um, Jan Morris, stand up Jan, has uh, agreed to be the chief editor for it. Uh, Rich Dro is also an editor and so is John King. We are looking for other editors. We're looking for a call for papers. Um, we're also looking for people to help out on the field trips. Dave Simon just raised his hand. Good, we've got another one. 
Um, on the field trip, we've also, at this time, Barrick Merker has agreed to host us on one of the stops over on the other side. I don't know if you've been over to Merker, but it's a pretty exciting deposit, and they've done a really good job on the reclamation, and there's a lot to see in geology over there. So consider submitting a paper. It'll be an exciting volume. Thank you. Uh, the AAPG Rocky Mountain section has has got their call for abstracts out for their uh, meeting this year in Cheyenne. So if, I don't know if you're aware of that, but they're looking for abstracts for that as well. And uh, the AEG monthly meeting is coming up on the 13th, and I believe Bill Keach is speaking at that, right? Okay. Should be should be spectacular then. Stay away. <laughs> Should be a good uh, good thing on engineering geology. Usually pretty is. So uh, we've also decided to do things a little bit different this year for our October picnic. Um, or, or August, excuse me, October. Yeah, it's a little nippy up there. Uh, we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to combine with the AWG and do a, uh, a field trip camp out in, in Split Mountain Campground, right? Yeah, Dinosaur National Park, we're going to have geology, we're going to have paleontology, uh, raft river trip if you want to, options, plus we got lots of geosites around that area, so we're going to make a field trip out of that for, well, two days, three days, whatever you kind of decide to do that. So we're actually going to reserve the campgrounds and um, we'll host the meals at night, that kind of thing, and so put that on your calendar. What day is it in August? I can't remember right offhand, it's like the third. 16th, 17th, 18th, that weekend. So put that on your calendar, okay? You probably could sneak a fishing trip in there somewhere as well, I'm guessing, if you wanted to. Uh, also, our uh, field trip this year is going to be on October 25th and 26th, Friday and a Saturday. Uh, we're, looks like we're going to be going down south uh, through the swell, maybe down through... Bryce Canyon, we're still working out the details on that. So the field trip will be going down there. Should be great weather for going down there at that date in October. So October 25th. Um, I think that's all of the announcements I have. Is there Margie? Great, thank you. Any other announcements? Okay, spend time with great. Good afternoon. I'm uh, Greg Schlenker, program chair for this uh, season's UGA um, meetings. Today's speaker uh, is Bob Beek, and he's going to speak on the uh, Utah's Mark Agunt and Severe Gravity Slides. A little biographical information on Bob. Bob Beek is a senior scientist with the Utah Geological Survey's Geological Mapping Program. Having joined the group in 1996, after four years and five winters as a mapping geologist with the North Dakota Geological Survey. <clears throat> Most of his geological mapping is in southern, uh, southwestern Utah and along the Wasatch Front. He is the lead author of three dozen seven and a half minute quadrangle uh, geological maps and the St. George Panguitch 30 by 60 quadrangle maps and is wrapping up the west half of the Loa 30 by 60 quadrangle on the southeastern flank of the Marysville volcanic field. Geological mapping is in his blood. He is continually amazed at what one can learn simply by going out doors and making a geological map, <clears throat> even if, even of previously mapped areas. And the discovery of the Markagunt and severe gravity slides are a classic case in point. Bob received his BA in geology from the University of California in Berkeley, 
1983 and an MS in geology from Northern Illinois University in 1987. Let's welcome Bob. All right, thank you, Greg, and thanks for the invitation to, to speak here today. Um, I was last up here, it was, it was four years ago. What, let's see, I'm not certain what happened to our, our slideshow here, but. There we go. <clears throat> So as last year, it was four years ago, um, when I introduced a good friend of mine, this Mark Agut gravity slide. It's what my colleagues, um, David Hacker and Pete Rowley and I, interpret to be one of the largest landslides, terrestrial landslides, uh, that we know about on the planet. And just a couple years ago, we, d we discovered a second gigantic gravity slide. We call it the severe gravity slide. And so, my plan today is to find the arrow key. Is to <clears throat> show you some of the highlights of this severe of, of the Markagant gravity slide, and then introduce this severe gravity slide, which a lot of you probably have not yet heard about. So I'll show you some of the examples of the, the kinds of deformation we see, talk about the extent and the age of these slides and speculate a little bit about what we think might be going on. And then I want to um, summarize briefly some of the new research that is going on as a result of a week-long field forum that we convened um, in 2017. <clears throat> and I'm going to start out with a little math so we get all on the same solid foundation here for what I'm going to show you. And actually, very simple, a little XY. Um, diagram here showing the worldwide distribution of, of landslides with, with small numbers down in the corner here and bigger numbers out on the axis. And what this shows is that most landslides in the world are small, right, or are, are smallish. But notice that little blip out on the right. What that says is that there are actually a few gigantic landslides that we know about in the world. <clears throat> that are an order of magnitude or more bigger than anything else out there. And I know of three of those, the two I'm going to talk about, and then Hart Mountain in northwestern Wyoming. <clears throat> now we could get into a little bit of higher math here. We could talk about probabilities, for example. And that, oh, God. <laughs> Blast! That's, that's actually easy to do. You just write the word probability on this little graph. <clears throat> and what this shows is that small landslides have a really high probability of occurring. But these gigantic slides are really rare. They're really infrequent. And so now, who cares, right? <clears throat> well, it turns out there's a, a, a small group of researchers who are really interested in these things. <clears throat> And they're interested in them from a mechanical and a modeling um, point of view. They're interested in understanding how these slides can travel such tremendously long distances over the former land surface when, when classical physics tells us they shouldn't be moving. All right? that, that's not my interest, and, and mostly actually because it does actually involve math. Um, <laughs> my interest is in trying to understand the, the, the extent and the characteristics of these two big Utah slides. And then in the back of my mind, I keep thinking about, well, how come all three of the truly gigantic slides we know about in the world are in the western US? I don't believe that's the case for a minute. I, I think that once people realize that Gravity slides can produce structures so large they can be mistaken for tectonic features. I think we're going to start to discover these things elsewhere in the world, and actually elsewhere in the Western US for that matter. <clears throat> now, let's see. 
you know, I think that's actually an important point. I think there's, there's gigantic landslides out there that we don't know about. And how do you actually tell if something is, you know, if the, these weird structures and rock fabrics that we see and that I'm going to show you are produced by landsliding or being produced by some other process? Um, and, and we'll talk a bit about that. <clears throat> If you remember just one thing from this talk today, let it be this, that ask yourself that question, where are these other truly gigantic slides um, elsewhere in the world? I think they're lurking out there, we just have not yet discovered them. So just a um, <clears throat> refresher about where these slides are. We're talking about the Marysville volcanic field and uh, no, See if you can see the, the cursor on the screen there, but this area in pink in, in um, south central Utah. This <clears throat> today, the Marysville field consists of the deeply eroded remains of stratovolcanoes and other vents and three large calderas <clears throat> that, that um, developed at the east end of a high elevation plateau that we call the, the Great Basin Altiplano. It's probably something analogous to like the Peruvian Altiplano in South America today. In this volcanic field that had its peak activity from um, 30 to about 18 million years ago, and this is pre-basin range extension, so this area looked, looked very different um, from what it does today. <clears throat> and interbedded within that volcanic field, and fortunately for us, we find these distinctive, regionally extensive um, ash flow tufts that erupted from the Marysville field itself, but also from calderas on the Utah-Nevada border, the Indian Peak and Caliente uh, caldera complexes. <clears throat> and those, um, those ash flow tufts are really important because they are distinctive, they're easy to recognize, they were deposited in basically in a geological instant. And so we can use them to get a sense for what the landscape used to look like um, and, the, and the, what the structures used to look like at the time they were deposited. So it allows us not only to kind of think about the deformation that's happened in the basin and range, but also this earlier episode of gravitational collapse of that volcanic field. <clears throat> so the two slides um, outlined in red is the Markagunt gravity slide, and blue is this new severe gravity slide that we recently discovered. In it, the towns of, um, Let's see, Cedar City down here in the corner and Beaver in the Beaver Basin and, and Panguitch to kind of get you oriented where these are. I like to think of them as these big southward tapering wedges of volcanic rocks, these andesitic lava flows and lahars, these volcanic mud flow brushes that's very thick up north, two kilometers thick perhaps up north and tapers rapidly southward to the, the distal end of that volcanic field. <clears throat> And we interpret each of these then to have moved rapidly during a single event um, back in the late Oligocene, early Miocene. We'll talk about the ages of these in, in just a bit. But each of those from this ramp fault um, shown, where is it? Right here on the Markagunt slide and on the Severe slide here, this is where the slides ramped up onto the former land surface and moved southward. And we can demonstrate that each one of those moved some 35 kilometers southward. I mean, these are really long transport distances. <clears throat> we can also show that these slides, that catastrophic movement of each of these slides was preceded by slow gravitational collapse of that volcanic field along what we call the Ruby's End thrust fault system. And that is this arcuate band of thrust faults. I don't have it shown on this map, but just north of Bryce Canyon National Park. And that turns out to actually be an important and widely recognized process of, at volcanoes around the world and volcanic fields for that matter. It's the Earth's crust just does a poor job of supporting these massive, massive volcanoes. It, it spreads slowly under its own, own um, mass. <clears throat> and on that Ponsagant 
thrust fault system that is rooted under the, the central portion of the volcanic field in middle, Jura middle Jurassic evaporites down at a depth of something like two kilometers. <clears throat> now, I'm not going to belabor the, the statistics on these things. They're really, really big. But to give you a better sense for how big they are, if we were to superimpose the outline of those slides on the central Wasatch Front, you'd see that it would stretch from about Ogden down to Provo, <clears throat> and from the Twila Valley over impinging on the Uinta Mountains. I mean, these things are just inconceivably big. The volume of that mark event slide alone is enough to fill the Grand Canyon to the rim. So let's look at some of this deformation. <clears throat> and I've got to start out at Haycock Mountain. This is one of my favorite places in Utah, actually. This is where we realized that this thing that people had called the Markagunt Megabrescia, <clears throat> it's this chaos of volcanic rocks. It's up on the Markagunt Plateau outside of Cedar City, where, where we first realized that, that that is only part of something much, much bigger. <clears throat> it's like if you, that Markagunt Megabrescia, if you think of it as a tiny slice of of cherry pie, for example. This Markagunt gravity slide is that whole five course dinner plus the whole pie at the end of it. So this is Haycock Mountain, part of Haycock Mountain. And I went here when I first started mapping <clears throat> to, to get to know these rocks. And what we're looking at are these lighter gray volcanoclastic strata of the Bryan Head Formation overlain by the Isom Formation. So this is a normal section in this part of Utah. This people in the past had said there's nothing unusual here. And there's a reason they said that, um, <clears throat> that I'll tell you about. But when I went here to, to, to learn this section, I got up to the base of the Isom, and I didn't see a beautiful ash flow tuff like I expected to see. The Isom is this very densely welded, um, 26, 27 million year old ash flow tuff um, that was so hot when it erupted, it flowed like a lava flow for the last few tens of feet of emplacement. So we call it a rheomorphic brescia. It's a really interesting unit. But that's not what I saw up here. I saw this. And there's two important points about this slide. One is that the isom, this cliff of isom, that the hammer is hanging on is just fractured and crushed to pieces. And secondly, look at what underlies that. There's this one to two foot thick unit we call a basal layer. So let's um, talk a bit more about both of those. The isom <clears throat> here, it's this really densely welded, very hard ash flow tuff. But here it has been crushed to sand and gravel sized pieces and re-lithified. Uh, and that deformation decreases as you go up section. So if you stand on top of this cliff up, you know, 30 meters above the base here, the isom doesn't look that badly deformed. You'd have no reason to think anything unusual is going on, which is what people thought in the past, because no one had looked at this in detail before. The other important point here, well, actually, if you looked in thin section at that isom, it's a cataclysite. There's some fragments of, of that densely welded ash flow tuff just surrounded in this matrix of crushed isom. But the other really cool thing about Haycock Mountain is this very sharp planar um, surface at the base, <clears throat> a fault, a subhorizontal fault, and it's underlain by this basal brescia. And that brescia is. Um, consists of this broken up isom and Brian head debris that's just been um, ground up upper, upper and lower plate rocks. And it behaved actually as an overpressured fluid at the base of the slide. <clears throat> and that fluid was then injected as dikes into the fractured upper plate rocks. The dikes here are kind of reddish in color. You can see those. <clears throat> the other cool thing about this site, not at where this photo was taken, but elsewhere along Haycock Mountain, is that it overlies stream gravels that are eroded down into the Bryan Head Formation. And those gravels contain 
rounded boulders and cobbles of isom, of undeformed isom, and of a younger 22 million year old ash flow tuff we call the Harmony Hills tuff. So here we have this beautiful older on younger relationship. We've got 27 MA isom sitting on gravels that have to be younger than 22 MA. So we see examples like this across the breadth of the, the Markagant slide and the severe slide wherever we see that base well exposed. <clears throat> And that, that basal slip surface itself, I should mention, is grooved and striated just like a fault plane and is fractured. So you can actually look at it and say that the upper plate moved from the north to the south. And we see these kinematic indicators all over these slides now, and they're all uniformly coming from the north to the south. <clears throat> but the discovery that really took our breath away um, came a few years later in 2013. And this is when David Hacker discovered a friction generated melt rock on shear surfaces near what we call the ramp fault where this ramped up onto the former land surface, actually not far from the town of Panguitch. <clears throat> and this is looking at his discovery site at these darker brown volcanic mud flow deposits of the Mount Dutton formation. And underneath that, these lighter gray um, volcaniclastic sandstones of the Bear Valley Formation. These, this is an Aeolian volcaniclastic sandstone. It has beautiful, big, sweeping cross beds. But here, all those said structures have been obliterated. It's just sheared to pieces. <clears throat> and that contact is actually not a contact but it is a fault, a slip surface, that is lined with obsidian-like glass. And that glass is injected as dikes into both lower and upper plate rocks. This is just amazing, amazing <clears throat> stuff. If you look down on that fault surface, you see that it's, that glass is vesicular. <clears throat> it's got flow features in it. Here's an example of a dike. It's a beautiful jet black obsidian-like glass. It's a pseudotacolite. Um, in thin section, you look at it, you don't see a lot. You see a few partly melted mineral grains, but it's a glass. This is under cross nickels. You uncross the polars, and this is what you see. <clears throat> so a few relic mineral grains, some vesicles in there. Look at the flow features around those. It's a beautiful isotropic glass. Barb Nash at the University of Utah has done some work to characterize this glass, and it turns out it is of basaltic composition, which for a glass is kind of weird. Um, but what we think is going on is that the biotite in this volcaniclastic Bear, Val Bear Valley sandstone is preferentially melting to yield that glass. Um, <clears throat> This, is, as I said, this is a pseudotacolite, and pseudotacolite is a, a pretty rare and unusual rock. You find it in impact events, um, associated with impact events, and you find it on the deeply buried portions of fault zones, like on the Wasatch Fault, there's pseudotacolite exposed where it's been uplifted. This, and I love to say this, um, this is the first reported occurrence of pseudotacolite generated by landsliding that we know of um, in North America. So it's a really special spot. And it's one of the few examples known in the world. And it's actually from what I've seen of the, the pictures of these other examples in the Himalayas and in South America, this is just, this is amazing, amazing stuff. Um, <clears throat> It's important to demonstrate high temperatures on these slip surfaces, probably in excess of 800 degrees C, hot enough to actually melt this rock. And what it implies is high slip rates to generate the heat to melt that rock. And people are now starting to work on that question, well, how fast is fast? And we don't know yet. Hopefully, we'll have an answer to that. but. From what I can gather, based on research that has been on, on other slides, 
that if, if we were to time travel back 20 million years ago, and we were driving from Beaver to Cedar City on I-15, speed limits 80 miles an hour, this thing would have just rolled right over the top of you. We think it was, was a, a very fast event. Um, We've now found pseudotacolite at a number of places on the mark against slide and actually on the severe gravity slide too. So let's look now at this severe gravity slide. These two slides here in green is the mark against and yellow is the severe gravity slide. It, it occupies the entire severe plateau. This is a ramp fault where it ramped up onto the former land surface. <clears throat> and I was actually, Pretty excited to get to, to work over here. This I started working on the mapping the lower 3060, which the corner of it is just over in this edge of this map here. And I thought, finally, I am off this darn Markagunt gravity slide. I can map normal volcanic rocks. Uh, maybe it would be a bit easier. And it was a bit easier for a little bit until I found this exposure. <clears throat> and this is on the Ponsagunt fault zone. Um, we've got a block of volcanic rocks faulted down against clarin equivalent rocks. But look at what these arrows are pointing out, this horizontal surface. The rocks below that are undeformed, volcanoclastic rocks, the rocks above, you can see they look kind of messed up. They're messed up. If you go look at that surface, you see it is grooved and striated and fractured, and guess what? We can say that the upper plate moved from the north to the south. There's a basal breccia here, and that has been injected as clastic dikes up into the fractured upper plate of the, the slide. Here's one example, hammer for scale here in this narrow fin is actually one of these clastic dikes that's rooted down onto that slip surface. <clears throat> there was a really nice day when I found this. I mean, it was just sunny and beautiful. And, you know, I just smiled when I saw this. It's like finding an old friend out in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> and I, I didn't really want to see this guy. <laughs> you know, I was sort of tired of this. I just wanted to map. And, um, I told Pete Rowley about this um, when I got back to the motel after, after this day. And he said he had seen something similar back in the late 1960s. Pete Rowley mapped the entire severe plateau for his dissertation. He had seen one small area of similar, look, similar weird looking stuff. And at the time, probably didn't really appreciate what that might all be about. But given that, we said, well, we need to relook at this whole severe plateau. And so we did. And this is the very southern end of the severe plateau now, just north of Bryce Canyon National Park. Looking at Brian Head here, these white fine grain subhorizontal volcanoclastic rocks. And on that cliff on top is the Mount Dutton Formation, these lahars from the distal end of the Marysville volcanic field. <clears throat> well, that cliff, this big cliff right here, 30, 40 meter high cliff, is not the Mount Dutton formation, it turns out. That's back here on the skyline. But this cliff, there's large chunks of it that have rolled down the hillside, and you can walk up to them and look at it. And, and we did that on this uh, field forum. <clears throat> and what this arrow is pointing out is pretty intriguing. It's one of these distinctive ash flow tufts that is here. It's an ultra cataclysite. And I've got some samples up here on the table. Anyone wants to see this stuff afterwards, just it, they're, they're really pretty cool. But it's this distinctive ash flow tuff we can almost not recognize. It's been crushed to a powder. But notice um, it pinches and swells. But notice here, there's this delicate little tail on the end of it. <clears throat> This is encased in uh, this very thick basal layer. And that basal layer, think of it, it's a diamictite. Um, it's just very poorly sorted, massive, till-like, concrete-like thing. If you go up, climb up to the, the cliffs themselves, which we did on this field review, 
you see um, examples of these things. They're kind of solidified. Um, here's looking straight up the, the side of this cliff, and those solidified shiny things are fragments of these ash flow tufts. And the length to which length to width ratios on these things are, are amazing, far greater than 10 to 1. I called them <clears throat> back in the day, um, and for this field forum, I called them taffy clasts and got um, roundly criticized for that. <laughs> to me, they look like taffy. They're just strung out. They look like taffy. But that implies to the rock mechanics people, that's just a whole different thing. You just don't go there. This probably is a result of cataclastic growth during the flow and emplacement of these slides. But a pretty astounding stuff. Another example at the south end of the plateau, um, a little bit of brine head formation poking out here. We've got a basal layer just above the arrows. And this whole cliff, you get a sense it's kind of tilted off to the left, um, back to the north. It looks weird to me for volcanic or volcanoclastic rocks. And it truly is. If you go up there and look at these, you still don't know what to make of these. But each of those thin layers, resistant layers, looks to me <clears throat> like a cataclastically deformed fragment of a Mount Dutton and acidic lava flow that's then encased in this structuralist reworked um, Brian Head sands. And again, I mean, that's this whole cliff. It's just weird, weird stuff. It could be that that's, the, that's our basal layer here. I don't know. Um, another example, it's the south end of the plateau. Notice that white blob down in here. That is a chunk of brine head formation that is thrust up into the base of this slide. Another example of, of the brine head itself, it seems to have this distributed zone of deformation at the base of the slide. You see um, uh, small thrust faults in here and fault tip folds, so some pretty amazing deformation. But again, that whole package of overlying rock, we don't quite know what to make of it. But here's you know, just some kind of examples of these mega taffy blocks. You know, someday someone is going to figure out what these are all about. <clears throat> Whoops. Um, and that, thank you. <laughs> um, another thing I wanted to point out is that the lava flows and the ash flow tufts behave brittly when you're down um, near the basal slip surfaces on these, on these slides, as opposed to the volcanic mud flow deposits, it seemed to behave maybe a little more plastically. I didn't say that word. That's not the right word. But, but they behave very differently. This is uh, uh, one of these distinctive dacitic ash flow tufts. You can see it's just pulverized. It's broken to pieces. And I mean, it, it's, it's just pretty astounding deformation. This isn't typical basin and range deformation. It's something really weird happened here. One other thing um, to point out, too, is that in these lahars, you know, they, they have all these big um, volcanic boulders in them. I've got some tiny samples up here of what I'm showing you is notice how that Boulder, it's weathered out from the Dutton. It's just sitting there, but it's fractured. And those fractures are offset, but they're rehealed. And so you don't find class like this actually in primary volcanic mudflow deposits. If a class is in a mudflow and it's flowing down the mountain and it fractures, it's going to be torn apart. These are evidence of deformation. Um, um, under extreme confining pressures. So th these sorts of things, we call them jigsaw class, and they, they're really useful to us that when we're mapping in the Mount Dutton formation and these really boring looking volcanic mud flow deposits, if we see these things, we know, 
or we have a good reason to suspect that that block has moved to produce them. <clears throat> um, just a couple words about the timing of these things now. Um, the age of the emplacement of these slides, we constrain that through simple cross-cutting relationships. And we know that the Markagunt gravity slide overlies this tuff we call the Harmony Hills tuff. It's 22 million years old outside of Parowan. It's, you've got that landslide sitting on top of the Harmony Hills. And we also have cobbles and, and boulders of Harmony Hills in these younger stream gravel deposits that the slide sits on. So, so the slide has to be <clears throat> younger than about 22 million years old. We also, also have a, an ash flow tuff that sits on top of the Markagunt slide. It's undeformed. We call it the Haycock Mountain Tuff. And we're still working to understand the age of that, but we think it's about 21 and a half million years old. So our best guess now is that this Markagunt slide is 21 and a half to 22 MA. <clears throat> And for the severe gravity slide, it's overlain by the Osiris Tuff, which is 23 MA. It's undeformed on the severe slide, but it's deformed on the Markagunt slide. And we know that the severe gravity slide deforms rocks as young as about 25 MA. And so the severe slide is slightly older than the Markagunt, 25 to 23 MA. this arrow I hit? Okay, got it. So how do we know that all of this really weird deformation that we're seeing is, is a result of landsliding like, like we interpret versus some other process? Um, how do we know that? And I would argue there's a couple things. One is that for us, it's, it's these basal layers and injectites that are very compelling evidence of overpressured fluids at the base of these slides, of single event emplacement. Um, and those, those overpressured fluids then um, serve to decrease the friction at the base of the slide and facilitate sliding. I think those are unique to gravity slides. Um, I think the pseudotacolite that we have discovered says that these things had to have been fast. They couldn't creep along and generate enough friction to, to actually melt that rock. And then the other thing is just is, you know, stepping back and, and looking at the big picture. All right, these slides moved from the north to the south. All the other tectonic structures that you see in this part of Utah are basically oriented east-west, right, with the severe compression and deformation, the later extension, and then with this younger basin range extension. So these, I think we're really fortunate here that we're not overprinting that, we're overprinting that at right angles. So to me, it's, it's really clear what, what's going on here. <clears throat> and this is, uh, I guess, our attempt to kind of explain that, um, a before and after diagram of the Marysville volcanic field that was built over the leading edge of that severe uh, fold and thrust belt. It was built on a weak foundation of the Bryan Head Formation that kept popping up in those slides, that white fine-grained volcanoclastic stuff. And we think that during the later stages of the evolution of this field, as it was piling ever more volcanic rocks upon this weak substrate, maybe there was some shallow intrusions, lacolithic intrusions that tilted that volcanic field enough um, to cause it to fail. Um, we don't really know for certain what the triggers might have been. Um, and, I, and I guess I should kind of confess here that we don't actually know that we have just two slides. It could be we're, we're looking at three. And I say that because at the western edge of the um, mark against slide, this area in green, we don't have any good age control. It's conceivable that we're looking at yet another younger slide. What we do know 
is that the head of this 25 to 23 MA severe gravity slide, we find the Monroe Peak Caldera that erupted this isomash flow tough. It's curious to me. Osiris, I'm sorry. <laughs> the Osiris ash flow tough. At the head of the Markagant slide, we find the Mount Belknap caldera. This is a 19 to 20 MA Mount Belknap caldera. Each of these, so far as we understand the ages so far, seem to be a million or so years too young to have actually um, resulted from the slides themselves. We don't really understand that. But to me, I think, it, it, I think we're just missing something here. The, the causal relationship of these calderas to these slides is, is, is intriguing. And it's something we have to work out still. Farther west, we have the Mineral Mountains. And this is Utah's largest exposed batholith. It was in place about 17 to 18 million years ago, unfortunately for us, at great depth in the crust. So it wouldn't have been a trigger to any slide. But the minerals are cut by dikes that are about 11 million years old. And we know the minerals themselves popped up to the surface rapidly between about 11 and 8 MA. It's conceivable, conceivable to me that the minerals are somehow involved in perhaps a younger slide out on the western edge of, of this volcanic field. So something just to throw out there to think about. Um, we don't know if that's the case, but it's something we're pursuing. And finally, um, just to wrap up, in September of uh, 2017, we convened a week-long GSA-sponsored Thompson Field Forum. And we brought together 27 people from around the country and a few from overseas. We had nine students, all sorts of backgrounds from rock mechanics and volcanism and landslides and structure and, and, and all these different specialties to actually look at this stuff in the field and to see what someone else thought of it. And it was an amazing experience, actually. It was funded, like I said, from GSA, but also from this group, um, the Utah Geological Association um, supported this, as did the Utah Geological Survey, where I work, and Kent State University, where David works, and Geologic Mapping, Inc., um, Pete Rowley's um, uh, business. And we had help, too, from over a dozen ATV enthusiasts from around Panguitch who hauled our sorry asses all around Haycock <laughs> Mountain to some really remote, difficult to get to places. So we had a lot of support for this. And what I want to do just briefly is, is run through some of the research that has resulted from that. And this is David Hacker and his first student, um, Stacy Steindorf, who they're, they're, this, they're standing actually on isom here. Notice it's grooved and striated, kind of cool stuff. But Stacy um, mapped part of the ramp fault area on the Markagun slide. David's other student, um, Shannon Hunter, to see the back side of her here. I don't have a good photo, unfortunately. But she looked at the Haycock Mountain Tuff, this tuff that constrains the upper age of the Markagun slide. And so we're still, she did a lot of good work pointing to where that might have erupted from. David has another student, um, Zach Lawfer, who is going to look at all of this tremendous deformation starting this summer on the southern end of the gravity slide. And David's colleague, um, Ashley Griffith in the white shirt, has a new PhD student um, just behind him. Mike Bronigel, and they're going to look at these basal layers and the pseudo tacolite and see what that can tell us about the emplacement dy dynamics. So that is going to be really neat work. And Ashley's also leading a joint, um, putting together a joint NSF proposal. Um, they'll submit later this spring uh, to look at, again, the mechanics and modeling of, of this big marker gun slide. <coughs> Um, Tiffany Rivera um, here in the, the lower, lower right and her student behind her, McKenna Holliday, um, have been doing some dating for us uh, free of charge, 
which has been really nice. Um, McKenna is actually going to look at a couple of these ash flow tufts um, in the Marysville field to see if she can figure out a relationship among those for her senior project at Westminster. And Barb Nash, I mentioned, I don't have a photo of her, but she works with um, Pete Lippert at the U, his work to characterize the glass pseudotacolite for us. Um, Eric Ferry, now at Louisiana State University, he's a paleomag guy. He, he was on this field forum, and we, when we took him to this pseudotacolite site, he just would not leave. He, did, he wanted to be just left there overnight so he could just look at this all night long. But he's, gonna, he's got a second NSF proposal going. He's going to compare this Markagun pseudo pseudotacolite to um, glass that is found <clears throat> in the Himalayas and in South America. So that could be kind of interesting. Um, Zach Smith is an undergrad at SUU in Cedar City, um, taught himself structure and mapping, and has done an amazing job of mapping half of one of the most difficult quads in the state at the ramp fault. Really amazing work. He's going to go on uh, to a PhD program with Ashley at Ohio State University. Um, in the lower uh, right here, Kevin Rafferty started out with Jeff Eaton at Weber State University, and, and now he's at UNLV, but mostly on his own time, actually. He's figured out the depositional response of the emplacement of this mark against slide. He's discovered some really cool things out in front of the slide, what's going on. And finally, um, Dave Malone in the green jacket. Um, he's of Heart Mountain fame. He's at Illinois State. He and students have been uh, doing quite a bit of dating for us, too, on these basal layers. So just to wrap up, um, they're big. They're really big. I think they're cool just because of that. But they're cool because they moved so far over the land surface, apparently so quickly. Um, there's a lot of new research that's, that's going on on these things. And um, I wish I could get this out of my head, but I'm still thinking, like, where are the others in the world? I think they're out there. I think a lot of volcanic fields probably produce things like this that you can spend your career working on one part and not know it's related to something 40 miles away. Um, but I do have anyone that wants to hang around and look at rock samples. I've got some of those up here, but happy to try to answer any questions you have, too. So. Yeah, Paul. Um, a rough estimate of the volume of the mark against slide. Um, we do. I think it was something like 3,000 cubic kilometers. Very rough. That, that'll be um, something that, that um, Zach Lawfer is going to work on for the severe gravity slide. He'll be able to give us, I think, better numbers for those. Hugh, in back. Right. That that's a that's a real good point. Hugh um, asked if if we can find the, the the strike slip transform fault between these slides, and actually we can um, on the severe plateau. I didn't show pictures of this, but at the edge of these slides, it seems like the beds rotate to vertical and they're incredibly crushed and damaged. And it's, it's really compelling evidence that, that we've seen. I, I didn't show that slide. And the other thing Hugh mentioned is that, well, you know, how do you know this not just simply a low angle normal fault or something? And it's, and it, and it, again, it's because of that 
idea that landslides, you have extension in the head, you have simple translation, and at the toe, you have compressional deformation. You see that at all scales, from a tiny little landslide to something gigantic. And on a low angle normal fall, that's something you would not see. You wouldn't see that compression. I think that's what you were saying. Okay. Margie. Is the internal structure um, going from the more deformed at the bottom and going <clears throat> to the less deformed? Do you see kind of different stages in each of them that are the same as the gravity slide? Yeah, the question is um, how does the deformation kind of vary top to bottom on these slides? I think from the the basal slip surface where we find really just all this fantastic deformation. And you get above that in, in both side slides now. Um, you can be hiking through section that you would have no reason to think is deformed. We can have slide blocks that have been simply translated tens of kilometers that are hundreds of meters thick and you know tens of square kilometers in extent. And so all of that deformation is down at the base and on all the fractures that kind of break it up. But within that big block, um, there's really no reason to think something might have happened. I don't know if that makes I was sense. I both slides showing the same kind of vertical structure, internal vertical structure. All right. You're asking if both sli slides are showing the same internal structures. And, and I think yes. That, that we see that basal slip surface, we see the blocks that have been translated and down at the toe have been thrust faulted. Um, we see similar deformation in each slide, yes. Um, not sure I answered your question still, but we can work on that. Yeah. Do you still see physical evidence of the breakaways going out in the field? Right. The question was, do we see physical evidence of the breakaway zones? And the breakaway zones are overprinted by these calderas. And so it's a little difficult. Um, but yes, we see, by and large, extensional normal faulting deformation. Um, that's, these faults are generally east-west trending, perpendicular to modern structures. So we see evidence of the breakaway, but it's not a beautiful um, headscarp that's still hanging around. These things are really old. They've been horribly modified and eroded. And so, and that's the thing. I mean, that's why these were only discovered a few years ago, is that they don't look like landslides. But they don't preserve the typical landslide morphology of a hummocky terrain and nice ponds and all these things we see in modern slides along the Wasatch Front. These are much, much older. We're seeing bits and pieces that we're putting together. Uh, to interpret them as, as big landslides. Mm -hmm. One last question. Just one more quickly on that. Mm -hmm. So what's the age relationship again between the calderas and the slides? Which is older, which is younger? The calderas, yeah, the question was um, the age relationship between the calderas and the slides themselves. The calderas seem to be about one to maybe two million years too young to have been directly involved in these slides. So far as we know, the dating. Um, the, the Mount Belknap caldera is, I think, 19 to 20 MA, but we think the slide itself, the Markagunt slide, is more like 21 and a half. So we're still struggling with, with, with a trigger for these things. I'd like to thank Bob for such a great presentation, and as his speaking gift, uh, we are providing him with Geofluids of Utah, UGA. Uh, All right. UGA <laughs> publication number 47. Thank you, Bob. Yeah, thanks, sir.